Ryan. I'm the children's youth and college pastor here. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 this morning, if you want to open up to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. We're in a series called Reset. Everyone say Reset. Reset. Uh, finding peace in the age of anxiety. Uh, so I just want to make sure this is relevant to our community this morning. Has anyone ever felt anxiety before? Okay, uh, I don't know how it's possible to be alive in 2020 and look at the news stream and the chaos of culture and not feel just a little bit of anxiety, except how many of you realize that Jesus is the most perfect, uh, peaceful man that ever lived? And, and there's an invitation for us to be people of peace in the age of anxiety. And so we're going to talk this morning about a practice that will help us to become people of peace and people of prayer in the midst of the anxiety of our culture. But first, I want to ask uh, how many of you in this room would identify as an extrovert? Extro how many of you would identify uh, more as an introvert? I love this silent hand raise. Okay. And, and, and I want to do this test. I think this is true. It's true in the 9 a.m. How many of you spend most of your time with the opposite type of person. If you're an extrovert, you gravitate towards introverts, introvert gravitates towards extroverts. How many of you? I think that's true. It's like opposites <laughs> attract, right? So my wife and I, uh, she, wait, what? Oh, I was just thinking I was thinking of extroverts. Okay, great. We'll talk about this after. Okay? In our marriage, at least. <laughs> Morgan is the extrovert, I am the introvert, and, uh, and I remember learning, and maybe you might have had this experience, just how different Morgan and I actually are as we were getting to know each other, and, and I think one of the most surprising things to learn about her as an extrovert is that she does not talk all of the time, and it took me a few months to learn this, okay, <laughs> what did you say? Okay, thank you, let's talk after that. So it took me a few months to learn this, uh, and so we were driving in a car one day, and, and all of a sudden Morgan was quiet, and I began to internally freak out. Is there anyone who's an introvert and an overthinker? Okay, it's a unique personality thing. Uh, I don't know whether to pray for us or just start a support group on Saturday mornings, but introvert and overthinkers, and so I just start to overthink in my head, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Something's wrong with our relationship. Oh my gosh, I think this is the end. We're done. And so in 15 minutes, I turn to her and I'm like, hey, are we okay? And she was like, yeah. And ever since then, I've had to learn Morgan can talk me down from my introverted overthinking, okay? I think at a gut level, okay, listen, at a gut level, we all know that in healthy relationships, there's a balance between speaking and silence. There's a balance between speaking and silence, and it's the same in our relationship with God. And if you look at Jesus's prayer life, we're gonna put it on the screen here, Jesus's prayer life, uh, he often withdrew, Luke chapter five, verse 16 says, to lonely places and prayed. Everyone say lonely places. And we see this pattern in Mark, when it was early, Jesus got up, went to a solitary place. In Matthew, uh, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat. He literally was so dedicated to having some time alone in the silence. He got in a boat and went to the middle of a lake. I wish I could do that sometimes as an introvert. Uh, and then in Mark, he says, come with me by yourselves. He actually invites his disciples and teaches them how to find this quiet place. Here's the invitation this morning. The main point that we're going to talk about is that our souls need silence and solitude with God. If Jesus needed it, you need it. Our souls need silence and solitude with God. So I just want to ask this question. When was the last time you were truly silent? Can you think, when was the last time you were honestly, truly silent? I actually tried on, a, on Friday. Uh, I was like, man, I'm going to preach on silence and solitude. Like, I've got to actually do this so I'm not just lying to everybody. So I drove up to Auburn, a little bit past Auburn and Colfax to find a place quiet. And literally, even up there, there was still the noise of the highway cars, okay? Where can we find silence in our machine-oriented culture? Um, actually, the Environmental Health Perspectives Journal reported that over over 104 million individuals were at risk of noise-induced hearing loss. 
and that tens of millions more are at risk of other noise-related health effects such as heart disease. Did you know that too much noise can actually cause heart disease? So that, if you add it up, that is over a third of the population of the United States at risk of a health effect, literally because of noise. There's a, a, a soundscape study, is what they call themselves, the soundscape study that started after World War II just noticing the increasing noise of our culture, how everything was getting noisier and noisier post-industrial revolution with airplanes and machines. And uh, I even think I try to be quiet in my house sometimes and there's still that hum of the refrigerator. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's like it never stops. And so there's this group that got together and said, our culture is so noisy, we actually want to study what's going on. Let's call this the World Sound Safe Study. And, and they kind of theorized this. They said, you know what, at one point, in Western history, the only omnipresent sound that everybody would have heard at the same time was a church bell. And now in our culture, omnipresent sounds, sounds that never go away, are everywhere. And I have to ask the question, if at one point in Western history, the only omnipresent noise that everybody heard called people to the worship of God, what is the noise of our culture calling us to worship? busyness, distraction. And so uh, we're talking this morning about the silence and solitude. And uh, if you're a charismatic, you've probably heard it called the secret place. Has anyone heard that before? The secret place. Uh, evangelicals are referred to it as quiet time. Uh, Catholics simply call it quiet. Uh, and we all know it's one thing to quiet the external noise uh, around us. It's easy to turn off the music uh, especially if you're an introvert, uh, to turn down that music. Uh, and I've learned that with my wife. It's like this thing we do back and forth. She'll turn up the music, and I'll turn down the music, and she'll turn up. It's really cute. Um, <laughs> but once we turn down the noise of our lives, there's a whole other noise we have to face, and it's the noise of what goes on in here and in here. And I think that's when we all get on level playing field, whether you're introvert or extrovert, when we really turn down the external noise of our life, we have to face the internal noise of our anxiety, our hurt, our pain, our disappointment, our anger, our question marks with God. And this is the invitation of silence and solitude. Here's, here's what it's not, okay, it's not this. Okay, it's not this zen, tranquil, this is not an invitation uh, for, for you to find a beach somewhere and peace out your family just so you can do silence and solitude. Okay, it's not, uh, how many of you have heard of culturally mindfulness and meditation, right? It's not this emptying of ourselves, uh, rather it's a filling ourselves up with God's love. My favorite definition of prayer is actually Ronald Rollheiser, uh, who's, who called prayer relaxing into God's goodness. But sometimes in order to relax into God's goodness, uh, we have to face those internal battles in our hearts. And here's what I wanna suggest this morning is, uh, Dallas Willard said discipleship is being who Jesus would be if you were you, doing what Jesus would do if he had your temperament, your gender, your relationship status, your number of kids, your job. And what I wanna suggest is that if Jesus was you, he would pray a lot. Is that a fair assumption? I think when we look, once again, let's show up those Jesus' prayer life slides. Uh, Jesus spent so much time in prayer, and here's what I love about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is they all highlight this secret place relationship that Jesus had with the Father. And in every single gospel, if you read it, the busier that Jesus' life got, the more time he spent in prayer. I don't know about you, but the busier my life gets, the less time I spend in prayer. How many of you can relate to that? Um, but what's interesting is if you look at Jesus' prayer life, the same word is actually used in Greek every time to talk about where he would pray, the place he would pray. It says lonely places. Uh, in, in Mark, it says solitary place. Uh, Matthew, solitary place. Mark 6 says quiet place. Uh, that word in Greek is actually the word eremos. Everyone say eremos. And what that word actually means, it says Jesus withdrew to the wilderness. The desert. Do we have a picture of the Judean wilderness? It's an isolated, deserted, desolate <coughs> desert or 
wilderness. And you might say, man, how does that relate to prayer? Isn't prayer just this happy, fun, God just loves me and I get the goosebumps? Um, but I think a lot of us, if we're more honest with ourselves, when we try and spend time with God, it's more of a battle than it is easy. I mean, you can relate to that. And actually for Jesus, his time of prayer was going away into the wilderness. And what I want to suggest for us, what prayer is, what silence and solitude is, is going away to face the desert parts, the dry parts of our own soul. And so we're going to read Matthew chapter 4 this morning. I just want to say this. If you've ever felt like prayer is a battle, uh, you are not alone. You are not alone. In fact, Jesus has one of his most significant battles in the whole uh, story of his ministry in the wilderness, in the Aramos, in Matthew chapter 4. So let's read this together. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, the Aramos, to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I think this is one of the most, like, duh, sentences of scripture. How many of you would be hungry after fasting for 40 days? And for, actually, can we just be honest? How many of you are hungry uh, after fasting from breakfast to lunch? It's like, man, I've got to break this fast. So, okay. Uh, uh, how many of you have heard of that thing called intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting? Uh, it's, it's really healthy for you. It actually genuinely is. Like, you can do the research. It, um, but I'm really trying to get the health effects without doing it the way that they, they do it. I'm just trying to intermittent fast between breakfast and my morning snack, and then between my morning snack and between lunch. Do you think that counts? Like, I really want it to count. Okay. So after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And this is the first temptation. Everyone say temptation number one. And this temptation is a temptation of appetite, of, hey, you need food. Why don't you trust something else other than God to meet that appetite need that you have? But Jesus says, uh, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he combats the lie of the enemy with the truth of God's word. And then he keeps going. He says, the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. So I just want you to picture this in your head. Uh, a highest point of the temple is the place where the most people in all of Jerusalem would have been. This is a public place out in the open. I would suggest if this story was written in 2020, it might not have been a public place. It could be Times Square uh, or something like that. But more likely, it would have been, hey, would you turn on your Instagram Live or Facebook Live and do this? Does that make sense? It's a place of public spectacularism. And, and he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that they, you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. We're going to call this temptation number two. Everyone say temptation number two. Amen. And this is the temptation of doing something spectacular in front of people to gain affirmation and approval when Jesus knew he was called to live before the Father and not for the affirmation of the crowds. So that's the temptation. Temptation number three is this. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, said, all this I will give to you. He said, if you bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Everyone say, temptation number three. This is the temptation of success and ambition and to do things that, that bring you power and glory rather than to submitting to God's will and God's way. And so these, we're going to see these temptations really become archetypes for us. And when we go to the wilderness, the aramos, the silence, the solitude, the place of prayer, oftentimes we have to face things too. And that's why it's so hard for us. And I think one of the biggest ways that we avoid facing these things that are in our soul, these brokenness, these anxieties, these depressions, these anger, this frustration, is through a little thing called hurry. 
Did everyone, anyone ever hurried before? You've done that. You've like rushed through something. Uh, you know, we're going through this book uh, as a church uh, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by a pastor in Portland called John Mark Comer. Anyone, has anyone read this or got this or listened to the audiobook? It's phenomenal. Uh, and he actually has a hurry test. Okay, 10 symptoms of hurry sickness. And so I thought it would be fun if we did this together as a church, okay? So here's what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a, a symptom on the board and some of these are a little bit vulnerable. So I'm gonna ask you to be brave. Can anyone be brave this morning, okay? And just raise your hand, all right? If it's you, don't even think, just raise it. And I guarantee you probably more than 50% of the people in here are gonna raise your hand for each one, but we'll see, okay? So uh, first symptom of hurry sickness, number one, irritability. You get mad, frustrated, or just annoyed too easily. Little normal things irk you. How many of you? That's you. Thanks for your honesty. Symptom number two, hypersensitivity. All it takes is a minor comment to hurt your feelings, a grumpy email to set you off, a little turn of events to throw you into an emotional funk and ruin your day. Uh, I'm a feeler. I get this one. I feel things. Yes, hypersensitivity. Symptom number three. Uh, when you actually do try to slow down and rest, you can't relax. Listen, you might know this is you if when you're sitting down, you do this with your leg, okay? Restlessness, restlessness. Symptom number four, workaholism. You just don't know when to stop, or worse, you can't stop. And I would add, and this might be a little bit convicting to even say, you think that the work you have to do is too important for you to stop. Workaholism, symptom number five, symptom number five, emotional numbness. You just don't have the capacity to feel another's pain or your own pain for that matter. I know this one's a little bit vulnerable. Let's be honest, how many of you felt that way? Just that numbness that comes from hurrying through life. Symptom number six, is out of order priorities. You're busy than ever before, yet still feel like you don't have time to do what really matters. Is there anyone who'd say, you know what, the older I get, the busier I get. Just be honest, be honest. Symptom number seven is lack of care for your body. You don't have time for the basics, eight hours of sleep a night, daily exercise, healthy home-cooked food, minimal stimulus margin. I would, anyone, anyone, anyone relate to this one? I would say for me, this looks maybe not like the body as much, but my physical spaces of I stop cleaning my house and let the dishes build up because other things are more important than being a human being, okay? I'm sorry, babe. All right. Symptom number eight, symptom number eight. Escapist behaviors. When we're too tired to do what's actually life-giving for our souls, we turn to our distractions of choice. Overeating, overdrinking, Netflix, social media. Is there anyone who's caught themselves on social media for longer than you wanted to be on it? Okay, uh, that's called passive resting. All right, symptom number nine, slippage of spiritual behaviors. I think we all could relate to this one. When you get over busy, the things that are truly life-giving for your soul are the first to go, such as quiet time, scripture, prayer, Sabbath, worship. I'll save you time. Let's all raise our hands. Yes, that's me. Symptom number 10 is isolation. You feel disconnected from God, others, and your own soul. On the rare times when you actually stop to pray, you're so stressed and distracted that your mind can't settle down long enough to enjoy the Father's company to relax into God's goodness. Here's what I want to suggest. Nobody hurries because it's fun. Nobody gets to the end of their day having rushed through the whole thing, cut lanes in the freeway, went to the shortest line in the grocery store, rushed through conversations, and then lies down in bed and was like, yes! I want to go faster tomorrow. Nobody does that. I think hurry is actually a way that we hide from the brokenness that's in our souls. Because if we slowed down long enough, we'd have to face and name and confront these things just like Jesus did in his Aramis. Hurry is easier than healing. Hurry is easier than healing. 
Because healing requires a certain amount of honesty to name what's going on in your heart, to name those things that are under the surface, and to have just honesty to say, I'm not okay. And we kind of, we like to put on masks, especially when we come to church, because, you know, Jesus is awesome and everything's supposed to be good. Is there anyone who'd admit, say, you know what, sometimes, in fact, maybe a lot of times, I'm not okay? You want to just admit that? The first step is just naming it. And slowing down long enough to let Jesus heal the deep parts in our sorrow. Uh, hurry is easier than love. Hurry is, easy, hurry is easier than stopping to let God love those deep, broken parts in our heart. And that's the invitation to healing. It's not just to get healed. It's actually to let God love us in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our weakness, in the midst of all the places we don't look like Jesus yet. Henry Nowen actually calls silence and solitude, he calls it the furnace of transformation. The furnace of transformation, the place where we let God into those broken parts of our hearts so he can actually change us to look more like Jesus, to fall in love with him more. Uh, St. John of the Cross calls silence and solitude. This is my favorite new phrase. All right, St. John of the Cross is a Spanish mystic from the 17th century. He calls silence and solitude the dark night of loving fire. The place where we reconnect with the fire of God's love for us and it burns away all those parts in us that keep us from loving him well. Do you realize anxiety, depression, anger, fear, torment, control, all of these things actually get in the way of us loving God and loving others? And that's why we want to do this. We want to let God into those heart, parts of our heart to burn away um, all the things that keep us from loving him well. John Mark Comer, I'm going to quote him again. He says this, but read the Bible. Satan doesn't show up as a demon with a pitchfork and a gravelly smoker voice or as Will Ferrell with an electric guitar and fire on Saturday Night Live. He's far more intelligent than we give him credit for. Today, you're far more likely to run into the enemy in the form of an alert on your phone while you're reading your Bible or a multi-day Netflix binge, or on a full-on dopamine addiction to Instagram, uh, or a Saturday morning at the office, or another soccer game on a Saturday, or commitment after commitment in a life of speed. And if you're still not convinced, and you're like, why are these things Satan? Why, why would you say such an extreme word? It's because all of these things, when they accumulate over time, prevent us from loving God well and loving others well. Yeah. So maybe you've pictured Satan like this. Here are the Satan pictures. It's the terrifying Satan. Here's what I want to suggest, for what Satan is for us. We're going to get real practical here. What Satan is for us in the 21st century. The demons of the 21st century. Number one demon. Are you ready? It's people. How many of you are like, I knew it. I knew it. Yes. My roommates, my spouse, my kids. Here's what I mean by that, here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. It's the constant need for people's approval and affirmation in our lives. And here's how you know you're facing this demon of the 21st century. Uh, it would be an island counseling, shepherding people, walking through this silence and solitude space. Um, I find it's common that when people really turn down the noise and turn it all off and get alone with God, they feel a crippling sense of shame and unworthiness when there's no one else around. It's people. Number two demon of the 21st century is your to-do list. And all the type B personalities are like, yes, I knew it. I'm ripping up my non-existent to-do list. <laughs> but here's what a to-do list is, and here's how it can actually be something that hinders God and love in our lives, is that we can begin to prioritize tasks over people. And we begin to view things that we're doing in our life actually as more important than being with the one who made us. And uh, more than that, it turns into sometimes a perpetual drive to keep doing in order to feel valuable. And as soon as we 
stop, we don't feel valuable because we're not doing anything. And here's what this one often manifests as guilt, that I should be doing more, especially in that space of silence and solitude. I'll tell you this, for me, this is my number one temptation I face. I face this every single time I carve out time for prayer is, I should really end this early because I have this to do. If you feel that way, this might be your demon, okay? Can I say, that's an intense sentence, okay. Uh, another, way, another way you can see this one is actually through the emotion of anger. When you start to get angry at yourself for not doing enough or angry at others for not doing enough. Number three is distractions. And we live in a distraction-rich age. At one point, distractions were just, you know, the, the cow on the farm or the sun. Now, we have Netflix. It's true to imagine life is life before social media. TV, Netflix, Instagram, and distractions. Um, and, here's what, and here's why it's actually a little bit, you know, because it actually goes deeper than just, man, that little ping on your phone. Um, by the way, uh, you know, as I've thought and prayed about discipling the next generation, what does it look like to follow Jesus? I think one of the biggest challenges uh, we're going to face in discipleship to Jesus is full-on dopamine addictions at age 15, at age 16. And so it's actually more powerful than just a ping on your phone and the incessant need to look at the screen. It, I actually think it points to a deep need for satisfaction that only God can meet. And what I find, again, shepherding and talking to people where this is kind of their main one, uh, what I find talking to them is, is oftentimes when they turn off the noise, when they, turn, when they put down the distractions, where, when it's just them and God, they feel a deep sense of disorientation and fear without the comfort of those distractions in their life. So if you face fear, that, that might be yours. So just in case this isn't clear enough, um, I actually made a chart to help describe it. So I don't know if it helps you, but it's like, a, it's, it's like my, my hobby. So this is what I did for fun this week. Uh, 21st century, once again, we have people, to-do lists, and distractions of social media, Netflix, all that. Here's what the voice sounds like in your head. Here's what the voice sounds like in your head. If it's people, that voice sounds like be more. You're not worthy or enough when it's just you and God. There's more that you could be. For to-do list, the voice sounds like do more. And once again, I relate to this one on such a core level. I have a continual track in my head saying, you're not doing enough. Do more. Try harder. Do more. Uh, and distractions, the voice sounds like have more. It's a sinister light. You don't have enough. You need more experience, more money, more of something in order to feel deeply satisfied. And this is where Matthew 4 ties in. These are actually the temptations 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus faced in the desert. Temptation number one is if you are the son of God, go stand on top of the temple and jump off. Angels will come. Jesus' first temptation was a temptation to do something spectacular in front of a ton of people. Uh, To-do list it showed up for Jesus when uh, Satan said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give all the kingdoms of the world to you. Once again, this temptation of success and achievement and power. And then third is, if you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. The temptation of having more than what you already have in God. Uh, Mike Breen, who actually heard speak last week, named these three areas. But these, these areas have been talked about for as long as Matthew 4 has been talked about. by right? The Desert Fathers, different spiritual writers. Uh, but Mike Breen names them like this. For people, he says, the core issue there is approval. And for people who struggle with this, it's a deep need for affirmation and approval, uh, a deep need for people to like us. For to-do lists, it's ambition. And people with this have a deep need to do, to accomplish, to succeed. Uh, for distractions, the core issue is appetite. And people with this have a deep need for satisfaction and fulfillment. And in case you're still not convinced that these are the demons that we face whenever we try and turn down the music, turn down the noise, and just be with God, I want to show you the demonic lie that's behind each of these. For people and approval, it's this. Someone else is more important than God. Someone else's opinion, someone else's approval, someone else's voice, someone else's time 
is more important than time with God. For ambition, it's doing for God is more important than being with God. Actually puts the second commandment before the first. You're supposed to love God and out of that place love others. Um, but the sinister lie is that loving others is actually more important than loving God rather than letting it flow from that place. And for distractions, the lie is this. Something is more satisfying than God's presence. So can we just take a moment to look at that? Can we be honest? I mean, we already were really honest this morning. If you haven't noticed, this is an honest church. Like, we don't try and lie to you. Like, we try and be real honest here. Um, if you had to pick your number one temptation that you face, or that you would face if you turned down the music, got away from all the people, found your aramos with God, which one do you think would be yours? How many of you would say, you know what, for me it's probably people and approval? Just be honest, raise your hand if it's you. How many of you would say, for me it's probably, you know what, it's that to-do list and ambition. I'm right there with you, I understand. And number three, how many of you say, you know what, for me it's distractions and appetite? Um, there's a long, and, and someone can come up to the keys or, or the band, there's a long Henry Nouwen quote uh, that kind of sums up this whole message. Uh, and, and Henry Nouwen is a famous spiritual writer. Uh, he was actually a, a uh, teacher at both Harvard and Princeton. Uh, and at the end of his life felt God's call to give up his post at Harvard and go, to, and go serve in, in a home uh, for the mentally disabled. And so he went and spent the last 12 years of his life in the image of Jesus serving people who would never read his books, never listen to his lectures, and never understand his ideas. And he said this, he said this, it's kind of a long quote, but it sums it up so well. Um, I, I wanted to read it at the end here. It says this, in order to understand the meaning of solitude, we must first unmask the ways that solitude has been distorted by our world. For us, solitude most often means privacy. We have come to the dubious conviction that we all have a right to privacy. We also think of a solitude as a station where we can recharge our batteries. Once again, solitude is not just for the introverts to have some glorified me time. It's a necessity of the soul. And here's why. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. No friends to talk with. No telephone calls to make, we might say. No texts to answer. No meetings to attend. No music to entertain. No books to distract. Just me. Naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken, nothing. It is this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude. A nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends or people in approval. My work or my to-do lists and ambition or my distractions and appetites so that I can forget my nothingness and make myself believe that I am worth something. And here's why it matters. Last, last slide, the struggle is real because the danger is real. It is the danger of living the whole of our life as one long defense against the reality of our condition, one restless effort to convince ourselves of our virtuous. Yet Jesus did not come to call the virtuous, but the sinners. Or Paul might say it this way. He may say, in my weakness, I am made strong. And here's the invitation tonight. The invitation is not just to face our brokenness and feel weak. The invitation is in our weakness to meet the crucified Jesus that brings us resurrection life. The invitation is in that space to meet his love in a fresh way. I've shared my story here before, but I had a crippling anxiety attack at the end of 2018. I've spent this whole last year, all of 2019, wrestling with how did I follow Jesus for 10 years and not address the brokenness that was in my soul. I had a, a discipleship group and the leader told me to start doing this silence and solitude thing. I found it to be a huge challenge to turn down that inner voice in my head. And instead, I began to notice, man, I've got a lot of anxiety in my heart. I've got a lot of need for approval from leaders in my heart. I've got a lot of insecurities in my heart. And as I started to name those things, the first thing I did, and maybe if you're a to-do list person, you might understand, is I started to view that as a new to-do list of things I needed to fix about myself. Okay, can anyone relate to that? Does anyone view their brokenness as a to-do list? And eventually I was like, you know what? I can't fix this, I need Jesus. 
And as soon as I came to that realization, it was like something in my heart settled. And I have no words other than how to describe it other than just, because it's so inside, you know what I mean? There's external trials and challenges, but a lot of the turmoil we face is inside. And in the same way, God's love meets us in a special way in our hearts. And it was like the first rays of sunlight over the horizon where God's love and warmth went into parts of my heart I've never let him in before. And I was able to name my weakness and my brokenness and realize he still loves me. And he loves me enough to die on the cross for me and rise again for me that in my weakness, I may be strong. So I want to invite us to stay in this morning. I want to respond to God's love. Such a sweet sense of his presence that's in the room. I want to ask this morning, just this is my closing question. This is my closing question. Are we stirred up to pray and seek God more? Here's my question for you. Where is your Aramos? Where is your desert place? Where is your desert place? Uh, you know, for Susanna Wesley, the mother of eight children, it was actually underneath her apron as her eight kids were running around the kitchen. She found her Aramos with God. For Eric Little, the Olympic athlete, uh, he said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. For Eric Little, it was running. Uh, I surveyed some parents of young kids on the way preparation for this message, trying to figure out uh, what different parents in that stage of life say their aramos is, and I got the best answers. The shower, lying in bed at the end of night, the car on the drive to work. I'll tell you for me, can I tell you my, my Oremos that I've chosen? I have a couple, but one of my big ones I'm trying in this season is the long line at the grocery store, okay? So I actually intentionally choose, when I'm at the grocery store, I'm gonna get in the long line and I'm not gonna check my phone. Actually, that's gonna be the place where I meet with God. So where's your Oremos? Just close your eyes. Let's put our hands out. We're gonna respond to the Lord's love. Just, just we want to become a people of prayer and it's not about doing more prayer it's actually about becoming a people that love to pray just name your aramos name your desert place your place of prayer and sanctify it and say this is the place where i'm going to pray and there's such a sweet presence of the lord can we just sing in response to the lord for a moment thank you jesus